from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Chris Murphy. I'm the head of the Near East section here in the uh, African Middle Eastern Division. The uh, division and its staff, and in particular our chief, Dr. Mary Jane Deeb, who is traveling to England today, all wish you welcome. Uh, Mary Jane also uh, sends her uh, regrets that she can't be here for this uh, lecture. The African Middle Eastern Division consists of three separate sections. Uh, the African section, uh, the staff of which concern themselves with the development of the collection from and about Sub-Saharan Africa. The Hebraic section, whose staff concerns itself with the development of the collection of materials in Hebrew, Yiddish, and other languages that have used uh, the Hebrew script, as well as Judaica worldwide. And then the Near East section, of which I am head. The Near East section um, staff also is concerned with developing the collection from and about all of the Arab countries, Turkey, Turkic Central Asia, Iran, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, uh, the countries of the Caucasus, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, and Muslims in Western China, Russia, and the Balkans or as I often uh, describe it to people, the uh, responsibilities of the Near East section run from Casablanca in the west to Kashgar in the east and from Kazan in the north to Khartoum in the south. I mentioned the uh, fact that the uh, staff works to develop the uh, collection from and about these countries. Uh, the actual collection of the Near East section is in the local languages, um, books in English and European languages about the Middle East are in the general collection. The Near East section collection consists of about half a million volumes, uh, approximately 250,000 are in Arabic, there's another approximately 80,000 each in Turkish and Persian, and then the remaining uh, numbers are made up of some 36 different languages, the largest collection probably being Armenian, which is now approaching 40,000 pieces. The staff of the section are also responsible for reference work and making the collection known to the uh, general public, uh, to congressional offices, and to the federal agencies. And one of the ways that this is done are a series of lectures often here at noon from uh, you know, people who have either worked on there uh, doing research in this division or who the staff has met through other uh, means. And uh, today, uh, our senior Arabic specialist, Dr. Fauzi Tadros, has arranged for the lecture and in a second, uh, He's going to come up and tell you about today's lecturer, uh, but just about Dr. Tadros himself. He has written a number of books. He's widely published, and I often refer to him as the Ustad, the master, because he has helped so many people in so many ways. So now, okay, thank you. Yep. Thanks, Chris. Greetings. Greetings to all. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker of today. Uh, Mrs. Deborah Doyle resided in Cairo, Egypt, while she was employed by USAID and in the Sinai region under the multinational force and observers. While occupied with both her posts, she was privileged with the opportunity to, uh, to explore many parts of both Cairo and the Sinai which many do not have the prospect to appreciate. On her travels, Doyle was able to interact with and relate to those she met on a personal level. 
For almost a decade, this outstanding photographer traveled throughout Egypt from the bustling region of Cairo to the remote parts of Sinai, surveying the landscape and acquiring knowledge through discussion and observations. Through this, she was able to inquire on the lives of the populace, particularly the Bedouin. Her travels allotted her to transfers through the country's most inaccessible province. Doyle was presented with a gold time opportunities to capture and record profound images which she encountered along the way. She compiled a splendid collection which sincerely captured the daily lives of those she captured through her travel lens. Her photos allow for the audience to become immersed in the diverse culture through the powerful stories she conveys. The engaging written text in her book accompanying the visual allow observers to become cultivated in the refined cultural practice of the everyday individual. The book is available now for those who are interested to purchase. Please join me to welcome Mrs. Doyle. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Murphy and uh, Dr. Fauzi Tadros for that kind introduction. I'm very thankful to Dr. Tadros and everyone here at the Library of Congress for helping with the arrangements for this talk. And um, may I just say, if I wander from the microphone, just go like this. So I wanna make sure that you all hear every word. This library is an amazing place. I sat here this morning after we'd gotten all set up and just looking around just in this room and perusing the books that were just there left by some researchers was just an amazing experience for me. And as I looked around uh, through the literature, the free programs, just this week, three programs right in this room uh, were amazing. It might even encourage me to move to DC. Um, I can tell you uh, just to partake in them. Thank you also to my sister Claire, who was a docent in this marvelous library. She served in the Peace Corps in Ethiopia in the 1960s and is still connected with programs to help Ethiopia. The people lucky enough to be on one of Claire's tours or the lovely foreign, uh, former teacher who I've met just behind uh, right there, uh, who are docents here in this library, I can tell are guided by very knowledgeable people who <clears throat> they're knowledgeable not only about this New York State, not New York State, excuse me, that's where I'm from, about uh, the United States, but about the world and the materials that they're viewing. I'd also like to thank my husband, Justin Doyle, who had the insight to switch from a very comfortable law firm job to join the Foreign Service and head to Cairo, Egypt for our first posting. My story is how a mid-career change of employment for my husband and myself, I was known in the Foreign Service as the trailing spouse who had to give up a job to go over there, led to new jobs and, and in the long run a wider global perspective for us, for Judd and myself, for our children, and for our grandchildren. I hope to give each of you an insight into the lives of ordinary Egyptians. First of all, I want to give you an idea. I thought <clears throat> you're probably interested. Well, how did you get over there in mid-career, and how did this all happen? And uh, so I want to give you an idea, first of all, of how we lived in Cairo and in the Sinai and how I became involved with photographing the people of Egypt. Judd and I arrived in <coughs> Egypt in 1993 when he accepted a job in the Foreign Service as a lawyer with USAID. 
which is, uh, I'm sure you know, is our foreign assistance agency. Here's a view. Here's a view from our, appoint, uh, our par apartment, which was set up um, by USAID. And I nearly died when they came in and showed us this apartment, beautiful parquet floors. And we looked out that window across the Indian ambassador's residence out to the Nile. And that's where we had dinner every night. I retired from teaching history. AP European History and Global Studies in Pittsburgh, New York. This was a job I loved, and, uh, but I had to retire from it in order to join Judd uh, uh, in Egypt. But uh, yeah, it's always, I'm, I, I am, I'm a glasses half full person because I was lucky enough to get a job in the US Embassy teaching English which I had to learn. English is a second language, but I learned it, and um, taught to Egyptians working in the U.S. Embassy. It was a neat way to get to know the people because we taught job-specific English from maintenance workers right up to the highest foreign service nationals working in the embassy for the top political or economic officers. And it was a different kind of classroom teaching from uh, uh, high school students who are neat and who I loved, uh, but 25 to 30 in a class every day, five classes, three minutes between classes, uh, to about this number of people um, in a class sitting around a table and teaching adults. So that was really neat and it really helped me learn a lot about every level of Egyptian society. While in Egypt, this was just kind of a neat thing that just happened. I received my foreign press credentials. This enabled me to cover visits in Egypt of Bill and Hillary Clinton, Tipper and Al Gore, even Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales. Now, how did I get to do this? Well, when I was teaching, I often had the kids debate in class. I was in charge of the Model UN and the foreign exchange programs. And I'd have the students debate, and I would bring in speakers, a speaker from um, Israel, and then the next day, somebody from Egypt. It happened to be a doctoral student at the U of R who had become part of our family, Ahmed Metwali. And uh, uh, Ahmed spoke. Uh, what they talked about was whether we should have a Palestinian state. And then, I arrive in Egypt, 1994, the Oslo Accords. They're signing a, an agreement um, towards rec the idea of a Palestinian state in Cairo. Isaac Rabin was coming, Yasser Arafat. And I heard it was down in the, um, down in the uh, uh, convention center. And I said, well, I have top security clearance. I'd love to go down and see this in person. Oh, no. You, I, I'm sure there's some government workers here. There can be a lot of bureaucracy. Uh, no, Mrs. Doyle, can't do that um, because uh, there's a le real worry about um, security. But you can watch it on, the, on a remote control. That wasn't going to be enough for me. It had to be for that. But then he said, I said, then I made up a little lie. I said, well, um, my hometown newspaper is asking me to write a story about this. Because I had heard that there was another um, person like myself <coughs> that was going to go down for that same reason. And they said, well, you have to have a letter from the paper. So it was too late to get it for that event. But I said, this isn't going to happen again. So. Uh, happens Judd represented when we were, <laughs> when he was in private practice, the uh, Daily News, the Cairo Messenger, and the Brighton Pittsford Post. Now these are not world famous, uh, you know, they really don't uh, put in articles globally. But the wonderful, I'll never forget the letter that he wrote back. This is to introduce you to Deborah Doyle, the Middle East correspondent for the Brighton Pittsford Post. So I had little cards. I'm sure that 
my Egyptian friend I've just met, Waleed, back there, probably remembers, everybody has a card when you're in Egypt. So I had Deborah Doyle on the card, uh, <coughs> Mohammed Masar Street, Zamalek, um, uh, Middle East correspondent for the Brighton Pittsford Post. And um, that opened all these doors for me. And I did write articles, and actually the Brighton Pittsford Post published them all. And all the people I knew back there, they published them verbatim. I was very careful everything I said. But that's how I got my press credentials. And I must tell you, I, uh, when President Clinton was coming, it, it opened my eye as to what it means for a presidential visit. He was only in Egypt for nine hours <coughs> for this visit with Mubarak. And um, he, he was arriving, he and Hillary, at about 12 o'clock at midnight. So I went over to where the press was. The entire Marriott Hotel, which is an amazing hotel in Egypt, the whole ballroom is filled with international reporters all ready to cover just this short nine-hour visit. And then I saw a sign It said, um, bus leaves for the tomb, meaning Sadat's tomb, at um, 11 o'clock, press bus. So I um, went and got on the bus. I had with my press credentials a credential for the next day to go to the press conference, conference out in um, out at the President's Palace, Mubarak's Palace, but I did not have a press pass for the bus. But I got on the bus, <coughs> my hands were a little sweaty, I can still remember it, and I decided I have to act like I belong here, so I poked the, the back of the person in front of me and I said, uh, what paper do you represent? And she turned around and she said, I'm Jill Doherty from CNN, and next to her is Andrea Mitchell from, from <coughs> NBC. Well, <coughs> I, uh, I was a little nervous at that, and she, they said, well, what paper do you represent? I thought I've got to ca carry this right off. I said, I'm Debbie Doyle, uh, and I represent the Brighton Pittsford Post. Women that they were, they never went like this that I probably would have said. They said, oh, that's wonderful. <coughs> so anyway, that's how I got my press credentials. Um, and that opened up doors to be able to see the President Mubarak's palace, and there was the press conference the next day with Clinton. And Tipper and Al Gore, when they were together, it was so romantic, I thought. The entire, just like Washington was closed down when um, I think Alice and Jenny back there ran into the President's motorcade today, um, they had shut down the entire pyramids and then uh, Tipper had been out there riding horses, and she met Al Gore, and I rode in the motorcade with him out through Egypt. I'll never forget it, I timed it. And I'm sure those of you who are in Egypt, and if you're in a motorcade from the US Embassy to the pyramids takes a long time. It took us 12 minutes <laughs> when every street was closed down, and then I felt guilty. All these nice Egyptians, and they're being held up for this meeting out there, but that's the way life is. And then, <clears throat> after four years in Egypt, followed by two years in Botswana, we returned to Egypt. This time, Judd took a job with the MFO, which is called the Multinational Force and Observers. It's the peacekeeping organization established after the Camp David Accords in 1978 to monitor the border between Egypt and Israel. We lived in the Sinai on an old Israeli military base, 15 kilometers from the border at Gaza. So if you just look here, that's where we lived, in the North Camp. Um, so here's North Camp right here. This peacekeeping group is still there. Uh, the border is roughly here from Elat or Tava. And then it comes, oops, I'll just go back. The border roughly goes, we were about 15 kilometers from it. Whenever there were bombings in Gaza, our windows shook in the camp. We were that close. Um, and then, to give you an idea, in the middle you'll see the flags of Israel and Egypt and um, 
uh, the MFO flag. The U.S., Israel, and um, uh, U.S. and Israel uh, and Egypt equally support this peacekeeping group. And there are 11 different countries, which you'll see around the border, ranging from Fiji to Colombia to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, who contribute troops. It's a very, um, it's a very successful treaty. It has been. It's still in effect. I think life there, because we're still in contact with people there, is much more difficult for them now. They can't leave like we could on the weekend and drive into Cairo. And what they had were these, do you see the Fiji bat at the north, meaning the Fijians, amazing soldiers and amazing people, and the Colombians, and then down here is what they call the U.S. bat. That's where all the U.S. troops, many of them now from the National Guard, were there. And here's North Camp. I can remember when we rode in a taxi out there for four hours when Judd was first introducing me. I came a few month, about a month later after he'd gotten settled. And here we came into the camp this way. This was the camp. And as we kept going out and the, the cab overheated, we had to find a, uh, somebody with a hose to put water on the cab. Well, we finally got out to the camp and we actually lived and this is an old Israeli military base because, as you know, Israel gave back the Sinai to Egypt um, in, at Camp David. Uh, let's see, when Sadat uh, went to Cairo, or went to Jerusalem. There's our house right there, that little one right there. We lived in what they called a villa. And, you know, I learned a lot from that experience. It was 900 square feet, and yet, we had all we needed. Why do you need so much in life? That was what I learned from that ex encounter. Towards the end, it got a little dicey um, security-wise. There had been a couple attempts of people that had gone out from the camp. So then when we went out, that's in front of our little house. And um, the desert bloomed. Mohammed, who was the gardener that came every day, we had all these beautiful desert flowers and it was wonderful. But uh, we had to wear these um, flak jackets and helmets only in the last, about the last year, wouldn't you say, Jess, was it about, yeah, uh, when we were there. I think it made us more targets, to tell you the truth, because what happened is we had to be accompanied. We would be driving in our car, but then we're accompanied by a van or a SUV behind us with these youngins with these uh, AK-47 sticking out the window, which I thought was announcing, hey, here come some foreigners, take, on, take them on. <clears throat> um, while I was in the Sinai, I taught Western civilization and ancient Egyptian history to enlisted U.S. soldiers through the University of Maryland. I must say I'm impressed with the excellent job our U.S. military is doing educating our enlisted men. I saw uh, a lot of our schools are not, are not high schools in this country, are not uh, reaching these kids, but the many of them came from very difficult home situations. But the discipline and the educational advantages that our U.S. military gave to these kids was amazing. And I'll never forget the student who came to me he had, uh, they, were, they didn't have to wear their uniforms to class. We met at, at night, and they're learning Western civilization. Many of them have never had a course. They've had only American history courses, and they're, they're, we're teaching them Western civilization, the Renaissance, the Reformation, things like that. And they had to come at night after working all day from 7 to 10. And uh, anyway, I really worked hard on them on writing. Some of them had never written an essay before. But through the University of Maryland's program, I'll never forget this kid that came up to me. He had kind of baggy pants on, you know, a little bling hanging down here. And he had, he had his card that I had given him, his report card, and he got an A minus. I had dickered, should it be a B plus or an A minus? I was a I really 
felt he should have an A minus and encourage him. He got that A minus. And he came to me and he said, Mrs. Doyle, I'm calling my mother right now, and I want to tell her in my first college course, I got an A minus, and he said, and I'm going to finish. I kept encouraging him. I said, get your associate degree, and then who knows what else. But I, I would love to, I've lost track of him and don't know what he's doing now. But that was wonderful teaching, and I applaud our US government for that. During these postings, I established a photo business, making cards and calendars. Any profits that I made, I gave to wonderful charities in Egypt for women and children. I became fascinated with the ordinary people of Egypt as they lived and worked. I traveled the back streets and outer areas of Egypt, camera in hand, speaking my newly acquired Arabic with anyone I met. Uh, I would go to bazaars, this one on the American, Cairo American College campus, and here was my wonderful Egyptian friend, we're still in contact, Magda Lawrence, who is an expert in oriental carpets, and she would sell her carpets, and I, at this end of the table, that's one of my calendars with photographs of Egypt that I sold, and cards were right here. I was also lucky to have a photo exhibition at the Sony <coughs> Gallery of the American University of Cairo, which was opened by the then U.S. American ambassador right here, Edward Walker, and his wife, Wendy. Some of my pictures you can see back there on the wall. Uh, Edward Walker, I still see him on television programs now. I believe he's with the Middle Eastern Union. Um, uh, think tank here in Washington. And it led, amazingly, these books, uh, the, all the photos into the book, which I was able to um, produce. It's a labor of love. Anybody in the publishing building business today knows you're not in it for any profits, but I wanted to share my love of the Egyptian people with, um, with the rest of, with my grandchildren and with the rest of the world. And it's happened like that. The sixth grade classes down in Collier County have purchased this book for each of the sixth grade classes when they're studying ancient Egypt. And they've been looking for a book like that. So I feel very good when it reaches out to people like that. And now to show you a few of the pictures. I can tell you the story of this first one <coughs> is why I really knew I was really interested in all the ancient monuments. You can't be an historian and not be. But I found myself, when I was looking in an ancient temple, looking around the area to see the faces. It was the people that I was most interested in. And we were, I was with a group from the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago, and we were on a tour in a very remote site in Luxor, where there were the um, <coughs> ruins of a temple that most people don't get to see. And the man, um, I, we're still in touch with him, and Judd and I went on a dig with, with him. He's head of Egyptology at Yale, John Darnell. And he was uh, quoting the hieroglyphs on the wall. I've never met anybody who could read them like that, and it was a beautiful experience. But I looked around as he was doing it, and I saw these people over here. I mean, look at those girls peeking over the fence. It was a mud brick fence, very typical in many places in Egypt, with the sugarcane stalks serving as the support in the walls. And they were curious about us, so I kind of snuck away from the group and got over and got that picture. Uh, I'll tell you a little story about this one. This is one of my favorite pictures. And I, I, this woman has her picture. She has that picture. Uh, and I'll tell you in a minute why I know that. But uh, I don't think she knows how many people have that picture on the wall in their house. Because they were having a bazaar in Cairo. And someone said, could you donate one of your photographs? I said, sure. It was at the, I think it was the Australian ambassador's residence. And so I had it framed, this picture, big one. And the person, <coughs> the ambassador's wife came to me afterwards and she said, 
oh, we had a little trouble during the party when that was on because more people were bidding on that picture than another really famous painter who had donated a painting. And so the ambassador's wife was, had to keep bidding on the other painting because, and in the long run, this one brought in a lot of money for Egyptian charities. So <clears throat> we had been on a, a camping trip. I don't camp now at this point in my life, but at that point, the British um, Council in Cairo ran a trip into the South Sinai, and uh, on a top, it was the purpose of the trip, was on the top of this stone out outcropping in the South Sinai. I believe it's from the 12th century. It's hard to believe, 12th, excuse me, 12th dynasty. There's a pharaonic temple, the ruins of it, at the top of it. And we had to climb up with a guide but we were walking, I can remember, we were walking on little, no, hand, no rails or any protection, on little teeny outcroppings. My, my legs even shake right up here now when I think of how we had to climb up to get to the top of this outcropping to see the temple. Then we climbed down the other side and already we're set up our pup tents. This is the way to camp. And the fire was going and chicken was roasting on the fire. And we had our dinner there and then got into these, Judd and I, Judd's pretty tall. And we got into this tiny pup tent and didn't sleep 100% during the night. But in the morning, and the desert gets very cold. In the morning, I unzipped the pup tent and I looked out and here, you had heard no noise, um, but I could smell the fool that was cooking this wonderful Egyptian breakfast on the fire. And these women, Bedouin women, had come and they were sitting along the side and each of them had a cloth in front of them with various woven purses, embroidered purses, uh, beadwork, one of them was an ankle. I didn't have older grandchildren at that time, but um, I think someone would have liked it. It was an ankle bracelet, and then it had a toe connected to a toe. But anyway, stuff like that she was selling. So of course I went out, never found a craft I didn't like to look at. And this woman, but I was drawn to her. Look at those eyes and that amazing face covering, maybe saved from her wedding or something. They wouldn't wear a face covering like that every day. And, but when she went to go, she picked up, I bought some things from her, and she put them on her head. And I asked her if I could take her picture. I never took a picture of any Egyptian or anyone if I didn't ask them. And she said yes. And then, and I, she also, there were a couple of children around. I took, I took a whole bunch, because it was this, this many pictures, a pack about that big. And I had her write her address on a piece of paper. It was in Arabic. And I taped that onto an envelope. But again, my students were such a great source. I said to them, where am I sending this? We're about 40 kilometers off road. And I'm wondering, where is she going to pick up her mail? And he, he looked at me and he says, oh, well, Mrs. Doyle, that's a, <coughs> that's a BP gas station out on the main road. And so the Bedouin would come out, they obviously, the, most of them had pickup trucks, the men, and they would go out and get their mail at this uh, place. And, uh, and so she has her picture, I know that, because we sent it back there. And uh, so I always feel good about that. I can remember <coughs> photographing a, a man along the road <coughs> in the north a Bedouin in the, along the road in the north, and he had his camel with him. I was, I, the camel was, was hobbled while he was working in the field, and I took a picture of him because Bedouin love their camels. So I took that picture. Um, the next, you know, a few weeks later, I was going along the road. I always had double photographs made. It was a neat picture of him with his, with his camel. And so I stopped a different man, and I said, in my baby Arab, now you can correct me, uh, Dr. Tadros, uh, into Arfa, Ilragohena, 
Is that all right? Do you understand? Okay. Do you know this man here? Okay. Thank you. And um, so, do you know this man? He said, yes. Then, admit it, even if I say it slowly, he starts speaking very quickly back because he said, wow, this woman knows Arabic. Well, and then he was going like this. I figured it was about three hills over. And so I gave him the picture, and I know that that man got his picture. That's how they were distributed. <clears throat> I was fascinated. We had gone to climb in the Colored Canyon, which is in the South Sinai, one day. And the Bedouin who drove us in, in his truck, to do this climbing of beautiful rock formations we saw. Um, oh, sometimes I, get, I would get a little elbow in my uh, side from my husband, because I said to him, uh, like, where do you live? This is all in Arabic, where do you live? I said, oh, you want to see my home? Of course I wanted to see his home. So of course we got into his home. This was his home. And uh, we had tea. They, uh, the Egyptians and the Bedouin, they, they might have the least amount of things, but you were always graciously received. And we sat and had tea. And I just spotted his wife at that moment. The homes had often, the homes have a courtyard in the interior and these kind of mud brick walls. And she was just looking out the door. And I was wondering what she thought was thinking. Just like this girl, again. Deep in the, this is the South Sinai, where I did a photo project with a German woman from the Goethe Institute, which was preserving, they were working on preserving the Bedouin culture of embroidery. And so this woman, young woman, had started a fashion institute with young women at the University of Cairo. And then it, they were combining them with the Bedouin women of um, the beading work that they did. And so we, she saw my cards at a sale once when I was sitting selling them. And she said, would you be interested in photographing the Bedouin? I can tell you have a feeling for them. So there's another picture right there. I love this picture. <laughs> I love them all. <laughs> this, we were in, I went, I had um, a wonderful person who drove me who also had an eye for pictures. Uh, uh, and Mohammed said, you must go out to the Fayum Oasis. And um, again, we were going to see ancient water wheels there. I believe they're from at least the third century AD that moved the water from field to field in the, in the um, oasis. And you usually don't see this, at least I didn't in Egypt, which is an affection in public from a man and a woman. We were walking down the street to go to see the water wheels, and they came to the door. I could smell, uh, I think it was tabbouleh. It was a wonderful smell coming from inside the house. And she was cooking her lunch, she told us. And the husband came out with her. And I love that picture just because one of my students, I'll never forget the story he told me, Hussein in the embassy, we were t talking about what you call your wife or something. I don't know what it was in class. And he said, well, when I go out, he said, I always walk ahead of my wife, and she walks behind. And he said, if I want her, I either go ch -ch 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 -ch, like that, or I said, oh, um Saeed, um Saeed, meaning he, and he thought, from his interpretation, it was respect for his wife. But somehow, Um Saeed means mother of Saeed, his child. So that's what he would call her when he went out. That's why this picture is, is just a little different, and I love it. We went out in the middle of the Nile one night on a felucca. The feluccas are those wonderful boats that are floating on the Nile. And um, when we came back, we came back up, this is called the Corniche. It's the road that goes north and south in Cairo along the Nile. I was also, I was fascinated with women carrying their babies, faces of old men, women, mostly women, 
not men, carrying things on their heads. And so I ran ahead when I spotted these women. There was a man walking ahead of them, but I had already said to them, Mumkin Sora, may I take your picture? And they, they, they turned yes, looking smiling, said yes. The man, I got this one picture. I had only one picture and luckily it turned out. Uh, the man walking in front then turned around and I could tell in Arabic, he's telling, tch, 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 tch. no, 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 um, la, 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 telling me and the women. So I said, Taib, Taib, uh, you know, Ana Asfa, I'm sorry. And, um, but then I walked along with the women because I was curious what was in these uh, cans that they're carrying. One of them has butter. And I went, because I went to Costco recently down in Florida, and four, I bought four pounds of butter. It's about like this. I am lifting it, just four pounds of butter. And these are completely filled with butter. The other is a white Egyptian cheese. And they've made the butter and the cheese from their animals. And, our, um, and it's, um, they're taking it to the market for the next day. I wonder about their poor necks. Neat ladies. Uh, obviously, I've started with the women, but I'm coming to the men. Uh, but anyway, this, carrying these, I have to watch my time. I might get the hook soon here. Oops. Oh, dear. I've gone on too long. Okay. Um, these women uh, are out in an area, obviously, in the dates, and the dates are ready to be harvested. This tree is at least 40 feet high, at least, very least. They're very, very tall. And they, the women climb the trees, do you see? They're on these knobs, almost like a rock climbing wall. And then... Um, She's carrying a right here around the side, if you can see just a little bit. Do you see that thing right there? That's the basket where she's going to harvest them. When she gets to the top, do you see she's throwing that rope further and further up the tree as she climbs up it and then is leaning out and shaking the dates into the basket so when the basket was filled with dates, she then had to hold that basket out and somehow take the rope and get down the tree. I wish I had had a video on my, uh, at, my, at that point to take it so that you could really see what it was like. She gave me one of the dates when I got to the bottom. I did take pictures of this out to that area again. And again, I didn't see her. But all you need in an area, they all know each other. They got the picture to her. I'm going to show you a few. I love pictures of men, and the older men are often sitting and relaxing. The quality, this is a good photo, but somehow the scan didn't come out too well. But these men were sitting there. I stopped my car. I was driving out to, from Cairo out to um, the Step Pyramid in Giza. And uh, along that road, it's a very, um, very wonderful agricultural area. But they're sitting just passing away the time of the day. As soon as I took the one picture, this guy then started going, la, 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 la. But again, I got that one picture, and there it is. Now there's this man, you won't believe, this man is in the Kana Kalili. I found out later, because I was always photographing men or women carrying things, I have another picture of him from another year, and he's in the same area, in a different Galabia. But I bought a couple of those artichokes from him. But I took them back to a store I know in the area, the pictures, again, and they knew the guy, because that was his little corner of the con, and he has that. These men I love. It's probably three generations of men. And Egyptian men and women are happy. These are people with not too much stuff. This is in the garbage area in Mokatam, the Zeppelin. And you see, they, they collect the garbage. It's now most of the garbage is collected in trucks. But in that time, it was in donkey carts. 
and the boys and the men went out and collected it. They brought it up here and the women and the children sorted it. 95% of it was recycled. And you see, this was the cardboard area. There were um, mulids, which are wonderful Muslim holidays, birthdays of a saint. And this was the one of the saint from um, Al Rafai mask. And I went down, and this is part of the Zephyr, which I think I'm pronouncing it right, Zephyr or Zephyr? 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 Okay, the parade. And I love this man. They, they would parade from one temple to another. He, they were going from Al Rafai down to San, Santa Zena in the similar area. And I'd go along with my camera and take the pictures. This, is, this man is a strong face. He's in the Valley of the Kings. And I found out from interviewing him that his, he is the fourth generation in his family guarding that tomb of Ramses VI. And he was so proud. And all of these gentlemen wear a galabea, which is the long dress, and these beautiful paley, uh, paley, paisley, spit it out, Debbie, paisley scarves. Again, you don't see a lot of affection in, with men in this country. Uh, and, um, but Egyptian men are very, funk, uh, they're very affectionate with each other. I've seen men walking down the street holding hands. These men were clowning for me when I was up in Rashad in the north um, to see the Rosetta Stone, what was where the Rosetta Stone was found. And, um, they were just clown, clown, clowning for me while they're selling their fish. So the children I loved. We were in Minya, where there was an old Christian basilica over a pharaonic temple that was in ruins. And in the area, this little boy came by. And I look at the lawnmower, first of all, in a country where it's mostly desert where he lives. But he and his father probably have made this lawnmower. And the wheels are made out of bottle caps. And he was so proud of it. This one up on the North Sinai, that little girl. I stopped along the road because these boys were waving at me. And I always kept stuff in the car for them. Uh, pencils, erasers, markers, candy. And I was handing it out, out the window to the boys. And this little girl with her uh, was in the back. She didn't have the goat at the time. And she was going like this to me. And that face just attracted me. So I stopped the car and she took me down to her house to a little, um, it was outside to a little um, enclosure that they'd made. And there was her baby uh, goat. And so she told me his name and she was so proud of him and she has her picture with her goat. This was during one of the, um, one of the uh, mulids in Cairo where they celebrate the birthday of a saint and notice with the birthday hats. Quickly, this is just a family that I got to know along the road by stopping and the girls, this girl, oops, I've got that arrow. This girl here and this one here were, um, were in the, in the dry uh, field, they were harvesting like weeds and things that were, they used for drugs from, from the plants. And they invited us. They said, my house is way back there. Please come for tea. And that started a friendship. For three years, I would stop by this house frequently just to have tea. And I, the woman, the head of the house, who's this woman right here, at that time was expecting twins. And they were going to be her seventh and eighth children. She didn't know what they were, whether they, uh, you know, no ultrasign for a boy or a girl. Um, I stopped back, this picture isn't in the book, but there she was with the twins nursing them the next time I came back. And this woman at that point, she said to me, this is a conversation in Arabic, she said, I want something, she's wearing a long, always long galabea. I want something 
for my stomach, she was telling me. Something, can you bring me, first thing she's ever asked me for, something she wanted to pull in her stomach after having the two girls. Of course, I'm thinking, gee, if I could wear a galabea, I wouldn't ever have to wear these pantyhose that are pushing me in. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, I then went and got her something like that. Uh, you know, you can get some underpants for women that have a little, little panel in the front. So she was using those afterwards. And that's a little jumpsuit. I would try to buy some new things along with used kids, the kids from my grandkids. But this new one, what, that's one of the twins the next year. And look at the rabbit he's holding. <laughs> By the ears, the rabbit never complained. And this little thing is an Oshkosh Bigosh from my granddaughter Annabelle. And her mother would go to her drawers whenever I'd said, I'm going back to the Sinai, any used clothes? She didn't take ones with holes. I was always given the best. The last couple of pictures. Go to Egypt. You've never seen fruits and vegetables displayed like that. And look at this. The pyramid shape comes naturally to that country. And I read later that that's the best way to preserve fruits and vegetables in a store. And so <clears throat> I've, I've had to rush there at the end. But um, somehow my husband taking this job, which we both wondered what we were getting ourselves into, then this mid-career <clears throat> uh, job change turned out to be an amazing experience both for my husband and myself. Judd's career was enhanced by two new legal experiences with USAID and the Multinational Force and Observers. I had two new teaching experiences with adults at the US Embassy and then with our wonderful enlisted soldiers in the Sinai. And to top it off, I published this book finally took me a little while. We didn't leave the Sinai. Judd didn't leave the um, job until 2007. And we went back every year, 2008, 2009, 2010, and <clears throat> spent a couple of months in Cairo. Obviously, we loved the country, and we loved the people. And um, by finally getting this book published, I'm able to share some good stories about Egypt, because the Egyptian people are wonderful. They deserve the best, and I'm hoping that the Arab Spring will work its way out and that they will finally become the country that they're capable of becoming. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Any questions, please? I'd be happy to take any questions if any of you have any. Yes. What kind of camera? A variety. When I first started there uh, in 1993, I was shooting with print film, um, uh, with regular, you know, uh, negative film. And I shot with a, um, always with a Canon. And it was a good Canon. Um, then I went around 2000, digital was coming in. I'm originally from Rochester, New York. Kodak town, and finally Kodak re recognized digital way too late, uh, if you follow some stuff about Kodak. And uh, I actually, my first digital was a little small Kodak, two, uh, two megapixels, can you imagine? But then I quickly, then I started shooting print and negative, or, and digital, which was confusing. You, you know, when you're shooting people, you get one expression. And so then I went all digital. I had to transfer and have them uh, have the print film because now all books are done digitally. So in order to produce the book, I had to get the print films. I had all the negatives. I had to get those scanned at a very high caliber, not just a cheap scan. Um, so those pictures went in. So it's a combination of a lot of different ones, all canon. <clears throat> and yes? So you, uh, you learned a little bit of uh, what American community about there. How did you kind of Iowa. 
That was the best thing I, that we ever did. I had never been in a class with my husband before, but the embassy <clears throat> ran um, Arabic classes. And so there were five of us, two couples and another person in this class with a wonderful woman at the embassy. And I took Arabic for three years. If I had known then that I would be in, that I was going to end up with 10 years or 11 years in Egypt, I would have also gone over to the university, American University and learned to read it. We were learning it phonetically, so everything I had to learn, I had to memorize. But I went out, what was, for me, I'd had all this French, but never knew how to speak French. We never learned much speaking, and I never lived in France. When you live in the country, I just went out, and the Egyptians are so wonderful. Just like Dr. Fauzi today, he, I knew I was murdering those words, and he's going, yes, you said it just right. He is a very good Egyptian. And that's what they people did. And um, so it was a different experience being in, with, you remember Jess when we were in class together? But Judd learned the grammar. He learned everything very, very particularly. Um, I wasn't as good in that, but maybe because the way I talk up here, I never stopped talking it. <laughs> so I even had a political conversation with the Bedouin women, because when I'm with the Bedouin women, they didn't know a word of English. And, and you know, that was wonderful. I'll never forget the conversation, but I won't say it here. OK. <laughs> um, any other questions? If you're interested, there are books in the back. And uh, more than that, i just love to talk with any of you if you have any more questions privately at the end. OK? Thanks to all of you for coming. See you again. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Thank, Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.